It is a tradition here at Wheaton, and we like traditions here at Wheaton, each semester to have a three-day chapel series on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday with an off-campus guest on the general theme of spiritual formation. It's a time to reaffirm our core commitments to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And that's what we will be doing this week, today, and tomorrow and Friday. Don't forget tomorrow's chapel, which is required, of course. Our guest this week is Dr. Lauren Winner. Lauren has been on campus a number of times on various occasions in recent years. She has many friends here. There has been a flyer distributed with uh, her picture on the front and the bio on the back. Uh, Lauren Winner is a prolific writer. In today's world of blogging, everyone is a writer. But what Lauren Winner writes is worth reading. Her writing is creative, thoughtful, and thought-provoking. We want to thank the Thomas Staley Foundation of New York for their help in making this series possible. In these three consecutive chapels this week, you will have, we together will have the opportunity of getting better acquainted with Lauren as she will be speaking very personally and autobiographically about her own spiritual journey. I don't need to say any more. I'll let her tell her own story. Please welcome Lauren Winner. Hi. Wait, is this working? This mic is not working. Is this mic working? Let's see. Yes? Yeah, there we go. Excellent. Thank you, mic people. Um, so it's really um, great to be here. As, um, as your chaplain just said, I, um, I love Wheaton. I've managed to, I think, find a way to be here once a year, every year for the last five or six years. Um, and I feel that that's actually quite necessary for my spiritual life. I always feel quite fed and leave thinking that I've received more than I've given. So thank you for making it possible for me to be here again. Um, you all are very well trained and did not applaud after that music because it was worship, but could, could I just break your training and could we just please thank the worship band? That was amazing. It was great. I am, um, I have been privileged to visit a lot of schools and be in a lot of chapels and the music just usually isn't that good. I, I think I say that every time I'm here because it's always true that Wheaton has the special commitment to music. And Scott, thank you so much for what you said. That, that was very vulnerable and true and struck me and thank you. Okay, so we have three mornings together um, and since that's a luxurious amount of time this morning, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about myself and try to set up what I'm gonna say um, in the next two sessions. So I'm gonna tell you my story, an idiom that I'm not wild about, but here it is. Um, in short, I'm gonna tell you how I came to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus, and I'm gonna leave you at the end of our time together with a question that I'd like you to ponder prayerfully and thoughtfully and let it kick around the back of your brain um, over the next day. I will perhaps call on people tomorrow to give a response to this question if I'm feeling in a particularly bad mood. Um, so there's this sort of literary archetype of Christian conversion stories, right? We have this sort of classic archetype where people have some kind of dramatic, dateable conversion to the faith, and that is a quite venerable um, way of narrating and understanding and interpreting one's journey into life with Christ. Um, St. Paul had that dramatic, dateable moment, for example, and many since him have, uh, have understood their own conversions likewise. However, I don't understand my conversion that way. I don't have a, I don't have like a dateable moment to give you of like, I became a Christian on January 2nd at, you know, 8.06 in the morning, 2003. Um, instead, I have this kind of long drawn out story where like Jesus dragged me kicking and screaming for several years and then I finally gave in. Um, so, so before that, um, I grew up Jewish, as some, of you, as some of you know, and I'm gonna 
But that's not something I've ever gotten like applause for before. So <laughs> whoever, whoever applauded, see me after and explain why that inspired that response. Um, strange. So, um, so I grew up Jewish, and that I just want to dwell on that for a moment because that will inform a little bit what I say in the next couple of days. Um, and I was like really into Judaism. Um, I tell my youth group at church now that they're you know church nerds because they're at church all the time. So I was a synagogue nerd um, when I was in high school, and I didn't do like normal high school things. Like I didn't go to football games or be in like the pep band or whatever. I was just at my synagogue all the time um, teaching Hebrew school, and I was in a Jewish meditation group, and um, I was just there all the time. So I, when it came time to choose college, and I went to college when I was 16, because um, I wanted to escape my mother. More on that later. Um, maybe. Um, I picked my college. I'm going to guess with some factors that are similar to how some of you picked Wheaton. That is to say, I assume that, um, that some of you picked Wheaton. Many of you, all of you, p chose to come to Wheaton in part because being in college at a place that supported, would support and nurture your faith commitments um, would, would be an important piece of your decision. Where, where's Lucy? Where are you? Lucy Hall. She's here, and I can't see her. Okay, my friend, oh, there she is. Are you standing up, Lucy? Stand so I can see you. Okay, my friend Lucy. Lucy, um, so I, I was privileged to be with Lucy a little bit while she was making her college decision, and I know that that was, right, Lucy, a factor in why you chose to come to Wheaton so you could be with, anyway, sorry, I just told her I'd embarrass her, so I had to do it. Um, and you may be thankful that you don't know me personally or I'd do the same thing to you. Um, so, I chose to go to school at Columbia in New York largely because there was this large Jewish community um, at Columbia, and I really just wanted to devote myself in college to spiritual development, spiritual growth, and that's pretty much why I picked the college that I picked. Um, and everyone in my synagogue community sent me off to college. They actually like created a little ritual for me, and they gave me lots of like Jewish objects, candlesticks, and and kiddish wine glasses, and so forth. And they sent me off to college, and I think the expectation was that I was going to come back eventually a rabbi. I think that was the plan. It was not anyone's plan that I was going to come back a Christian. That was like departing from the script. Um, so I went to college and just completely threw myself into the Jewish community at Columbia. I was the religious life coordinator for the Jewish Student Union, and I, I just continued on with my synagogue nerdiness just there in college. Like I went to this Wednesday night learning program, which was sort of like a Bible study, and my whole life in college was organized around um, the choreography of Orthodox Jewish observance. And then... Um, this strange thing happened my sophomore year of college, which was that I had a dream. Um, and in the dream, it has taken me many years to be able to narrate this dream with a mostly straight face. Um, in the dream, my friend Michelle and some other girlfriends, we were kidnapped by a group of mermaids. <laughs> and we didn't like grow tails or sprout gills or fins, but they took us underwater and somehow we could function totally fine underwater. And it turns out that Mer society is actually quite advanced. Um, <laughs> and the mermaids were fairly kind captors, like they didn't keep us tied up or in dark rooms or bound and gagged. We could pretty much do whatever we wanted down there in Merland, we just couldn't go home. So there we were for a year in this dream, um, murder kidnap victims. And then, after a year, this group of men came to rescue us. And I, I will confess that the gender dynamics of this dream, female victims and male rescuers, that has always troubled me, but we'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> be that as it may. Um, most of the men who came to rescue us were these sort of like 50-something graying, kind of paunchy NFL-watching type men. Um, <laughs> sorry, male faculty over 50, not looking in your direction. 
some of my best friends are men in their 50s who watch football. Um, so one man, however, and this dates, this is going to date me, one man looked exactly like Daniel Day-Lewis. I hope that you all like, even know who Daniel Day-Lewis is. OK, good. Um, and I was sure that he came to rescue me because this dream also stages my intense modesty and humility. Um, so I knew that Daniel Day-Lewis had come to rescue me. And they rescued us, and we went back to Earth. And then the dream more or less ended. So whatever, I have kind of weird dreams all the time. Um, this dream. Uh, this dream was unique, not for the content of the dream exactly, but for the, the clarity I had when I woke up. And I woke up just completely certain that the dream had come from God and that Daniel Day-Lewis was not in fact Daniel Day-Lewis, but was in fact Jesus. Now this is like roughly the equivalent of any of you who are sophomores having a dream about Shiva and like waking up confident that like, the Hindu deities have told you that like Hinduism is for real. That that's that's about the equivalent of an Orthodox Jew like having a dream of bad Jesus. It freaked me out, in other words. So I told the dream to to three people. I told the dream first to my college roommate, Beth, who uh, she's actually no longer living. She died at 32 of breast cancer, which was a huge tragedy. Um, she was, she knew, she had an, an intimacy with God that, that few people I know have ever had. She's an observant Jew. She just was a deeply spiritual woman. And I didn't tell her I thought the dream had any significance. I just kind of told her, because I often told her my kind of kooky dreams. And she said, I think you were dreaming about Elijah the prophet. Which is an interesting interpretation, because of course Elijah the prophet in Judaism is the person, the sort of John the Baptist figure who will come to announce the Messiah. So actually she got quite close in her reading of my dream to what I thought my dream was about. And then I told the dream to my college boyfriend, also an observant Jew. Um, he thought that I had like fallen for someone else and was <laughs> trying to find an elliptical way of telling him that. <laughs> so, so he was sort of annoyed. And, and in hindsight, he like wasn't completely wrong, right? In a sense, his interpretation was more accurate than I think either of us realized at the time. Um, then I told the dream to one of the very few Christians that I knew. And I sort of laid the dream out for her. I didn't tell her what I thought it meant. And she said, so, so what do you think you were dreaming about? And my heart kind of sunk, because I thought, OK, I understand why my roommate my boyfriend didn't get it. But if this friend of mine, this like faithful Christian, isn't seeing this as Jesus in my dream, like maybe I, I'm wrong. And she sort of paused. And I said, well, I, I think I was dreaming about Jesus. And she said, oh, well, yeah, that was totally obvious to me. But I didn't know if you would see it, you know, being, being an Orthodox Jew and all. That like might be a hard interpretation for you to come to. Um, so we had this conversation, and some of my friends then want to point to that conversation or point to the dream as my like aha dateable moment. But I just can't go with that interpretation because then I proceeded to like shove the dream in a drawer and ignore it for a couple of years because it completely freaked me out. Um, I was just completely in love with Judaism and, and did not want my life disrupted in this pretty significant way that having dreams about Jesus rescuing you, you know, would would suggest. So then over time in college, a number of other like slightly smaller but still significant things happened. I won't tell you all of them, or we'd be here all day. One was that in, um, in a bookstore, I stumbled over the Mitford novels. Does anyone know these novels? OK, so for those of you who don't know them, they're these sort of middle brow, kind of saccharine novels about an Episcopal priest named Father Tim. The novels don't really have plots. They just like follow Father Tim as he ministers to his kind of wacky neighbors in Midford, North Carolina. Um, and I stumbled over the first two of these novels and read them the summer before my senior year of college and felt that the characters in these books lived lives that were infused with faith at every level. And that although I was an observant Jew and my life was really choreographed around faithful responses to the living God of Israel. Judaism tells you that what you eat and how you dress and how you live in time, all of these things have to do with your relationship with God. And so I, my life was organized around this principle that everything I did had something, some way to connect me to God or distance me from God. Nonetheless, like I didn't feel that my life was infused with faith in the way that these admittedly fictional people in Midford 
um, were. And I think actually the centrality of the Mitford novels in my spiritual life is just further proof that God has a sense of humor. Um, because I'm really a total intellectual snob and would much rather tell you that I was converted by reading Dostoevsky or something um, <laughs> instead of the Mitford novels. But there you have it. Um, just one other college event I'll mention to you. I did finally, my senior year, go talk to, there was a, there was a campus pastor, a Christian pastor that I knew slightly. And I, you know, I was just, as you can imagine, very confused, right? So I went finally my senior college to talk to this pastor. He was a well-meaning and quite liberal person. And um, I, we met at this coffee shop and I said to him, I think I'm starting to believe in Jesus. And he said, oh, I, like when you said you wanted to talk to me about something, like I had no, I, I had no idea that it would be that you want to talk about Jesus. And I said, oh, well, like, what did you think I wanted to talk to you about? And he said, well, I thought you might be calling me, like, to come out as a lesbian. Um, <laughs> which was not what I was planning to do in that conversation. <laughs> but that may tell you something about the religious culture at Columbia University in New York City in the late 1990s. Um, so that was felt like sort of a speed bump in my path to Jesus, that conversation with that well-meaning person, the pastor. Anyway, um, so the problem with this narrative and one of the reasons that the dateable conversion narratives are so compelling literarily is that the narrative just kind of peters out, like it doesn't tie up in any dramatic sense. Here's how it peters out. I, I graduated from college. I moved to England for a couple of years to go to grad school. And in England, I became a Christian. I don't know exactly when to tell you that happened. I can tell you when I started describing myself that way, which was as soon as I got to England. I can tell you when I was baptized, which I would take as a significant um, date in my Christian journey. Um, I can tell you when I actually stopped being a synagogue nerd and started becoming a church nerd. But but I can't say, and then this one clinching climactic thing happened, and then I was a Christian, whereas 10 minutes before I wasn't. So somewhere in my 21st year of life, um, living in England, I became a Christian. Uh, it turned out that I needed, I think, like the Atlantic Ocean between me and everyone who knew me as an observant Jew to, to go through this transformation that turned out to be a pretty wrenching transformation in my own life and in the lives of my family and my Jewish community and my friends who, as you can imagine, um, some of them were fairly traumatized by, um, by this conversion. Um, I began to ask myself, after I became a Christian, how I knew, how would I know that I was living well into the faith? And I think that we can construct for ourselves all kinds of sometimes helpful and sometimes strange grids by which we somehow purport to assess our own, if you will, progress in the spiritual life or our development in the spiritual life or the degree to which on a daily basis we make choices that draw us closer to Christ and closer to one another or the degree to which we make choices that alienate us from God and from one another. And as I say, I think some of those, um, some of the ways we try to parse or read or understand our own spiritual journey are, are crazy making and neurotic, but some of them are helpful. And what I'm gonna try to expand upon tomorrow and the next day is one way of framing this question that I have found helpful in my own life, and it is the question of time. How, how do we as Christians live in time? Um, in particular, I became very aware in my first or second year as a Christian that there were many, many different calendars that structured my life, that, that choreographed, to use that, that verb and metaphor again, that choreographed how I lived in time. And probably the one that I was and am still most deeply shaped by is the academic calendar because in addition to being a synagogue nerd and a church nerd, I'm also just like a regular nerd. So 
Um, the, the school, I've been a student and a teacher my whole life, and, and the academic calendar is in some ways the most fundamental calendar in my life. So if you ask me when the year starts, I will tell you it starts in late August when my classes start. That, not January 1st, which is you know what the secular calendar tells us is the new year, not Advent, which is the church calendar's beginning of the year, but actually when classes start, that's when the, that's when the year starts. Um, Another calendar that governs our lives is the national calendar, right? Tax day um, for many of us is an important, it's not probably super important for most of you yet, but like in three or four years it will be. Um, I remember my first Lenten season as a Christian was also the first year that my father said to me that he was gonna stop filing my tax return for me and I had to do it myself. So the question was like, how was I spending Lent? Like, was I mortifying the flesh and repenting and entering into Jesus's life in the wilderness, or was I, like, sweating out my tax returns? And uh, the latter, unfortunately, often edged out the former that first lens. So there's the kind of government calendar, the State of the Union Address, Tax Day. Um, in my own life, the two intense calendars that shape my spiritual life have been the Jewish calendar, which I'll say a little bit more about tomorrow, and the Christian calendar. Um, and that's what I'll be devoting most of our time tomorrow and the next day is to looking at the season in which we are now, if you follow the, the old school church calendar, we're in the season of epiphany, don't panic if you don't know what that means, you'll know by this time tomorrow. Um, and, I, and I sort of said to myself that I would know I was really a Christian when the Christian calendar was a more fundamental calendar in my life than the Jewish calendar, than the academic calendar, and so forth. So I, w I said I was gonna leave you with one question. I actually wanna leave you with two questions. So one question is, what are the calendars that shape your lives, and what, what are the ones that do that shaping most powerfully? What's the most formative calendar in your life? Um, the second question is, I have told you sort of part of my Christian story. What I really think I've told you is the prologue. It's like how I got to be a Christian. And often in our narrations of our Christian lives with one another, we stop there. We tell this conversion story and that's the end of the story. But really what I've told you is just the preface to the story. The real story starts, right, when we enter into life with Christ. So I've come to People often ask me, like, how did you become a Christian? And I've come to think the more important question is not how I became a Christian 13 years ago in this dream I had and et cetera, et cetera, because really, frankly, the dream doesn't have that much to do with why I'm a Christian today. So I want to ask you also to think about, and we'll sort of unpack this question over the next two days, to think about not how did you become a Christian, how did you, like, sign up for this kind of relationship with God, how did God draw you to him, but but why are you a Christian this week? And how, and how do you know? Let's close in prayer. Father God, thank you for being so present in the life of this community. Thank you for the really evident, abundant work that you are doing here um, in this community as a community and in the lives of every individual who is present here. I ask that you would um, send us back into our days, back into the world, um, and as you do that, that you would refine what I have said. If there's something I've said that you wish people would leave behind, that you would just be a sieve and, and strain that out. And if there is something that, um, that I've said or that someone else said this morning or that was in the music or the prayers that, that someone really needs to particularly hold on to or hear, that you would enliven that phrase or that chord or those words for that person as he or she leaves this place. Um, I ask your blessings on the rest of our day, that as we go forth from here, we may be emboldened and empowered um, to be cross-bearers and kingdom proclaimers. We pray this in the name of the triune God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. See you tomorrow.